Hello, Lemonsterites. This is your state representative, Natalie Higgins, and we are finally back in the Lemonster Access TV studios. Uh, and we just got a little tour, and I'm really excited to be here for our December episode. We usually wrap up the end of the year, uh, and uh, my aide, Isabella Lara, is with me for us to do a little chat and flip the roles, yes. where Isabella is going to be interviewing me, and we're going to be talking about kind of the end of not only a year, but a legislative session. So this is yes. my third session, my sixth year in the state legislature. Um, we're very happy to be coming back for another term, another two years, uh, and I'm so, so glad that Isabella Lara, who's been with me for the last three years, is still on as my legislative aide, yes. and uh, we have some really cool things to talk about. I have notes, because a legislative session is how many years? Two years. Right, so that's a long, long time. <laughs> For us, at least. And so, when we were chatting before this, trying to figure out what did we want to talk about, what did we want to highlight, COVID has made yes. time very much. I talk about it as a time accordion time. Time has morphed <laughs> together here. So, yes. so it's it was good for us to, to prep for this and talk about yes. everything that we've done in the last two years and how yeah. quickly these sessions really do fly by. Right. So the start of this legislative session was in 2021, we're in 2022. So can you, Representative, kind of talk about the start of a legislative mm -hmm. session because we wanna get into some of the great policy that was passed in these last two years. So yeah. how does that start in, in January of 2021? So in January, we're in new session starts. Um, we're really looking at kind of what bills are we gonna file? We usually have a short window to file our legislation because of COVID. Uh, the House and Senate leadership graciously gave us a little more time, which may have meant we took on a few more bills, yes. uh, more than 30. Yes. And uh, so, so the new session is really about making sure that we've got our legislation ready, we've got our community partners, our, our co-leads in the House and Senate um, to, to file the legislation we're looking at. And we've been working on that really since September. Yeah. Uh, this is the first year that we've had some breathing room to, yeah. to really intentionally think about what legislation have we filed, which ones do we have the energy to continue, which mm -hmm. ones maybe need some new energy, right. and can we lovingly pass off to, to a new colleague who can, who can really take it and run. Right, so it has been two years with these 30 some odd bills we have. More than 35. <laughs> More than 35, uh, yes, that's for sure. And so how does the process kind of play out? So in yeah. in January, you file your bills, mm -hmm. and then after that, I'm assuming they get a public hearing. Yeah. So something that I really took for granted in Massachusetts is we give every single bill uh, that's timely filed, filed at the beginning of a legislative session, a public hearing. When I meet with other legislators at conferences around the country, I honestly didn't realize that that was not the norm um, and that it can be a partisan fight yeah. just to get a public hearing on our legislation. And so we're really lucky that on average 6,300, 6,500 bills get filed at the beginning of a legislative session and all of those bills get at least one public hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and something that came out of COVID that we're really looking forward to staying on um, is a virtual hearing option where constituents have been able to yeah. join via video conference um, and share their testimony. And this is something we pushed for yeah. four, six years and honestly got a lot of resistance of there's not the technology, it's gonna be too hard, people have to come into a hearing, but it's really expensive, yeah. really time intensive. And for most Lemonster residents, folks don't have the ability to take the whole day off to come to the state house. And exactly. I have been so proud of how many Lemonster residents have been sharing their stories and sharing their testimony yeah. um, in these hearings because they can participate. And, and thankfully, Speaker Mariano has committed that, at least on the House's side, they want to be able to continue this virtual um, hybrid hearing because constituent voices and the voices of everyday Massachusetts residents have been able to be lifted up yeah. uh, and, and reach the committee process. Yes, so we're anticipating that staying mm -hmm. throughout this next upcoming session. That's our hope. Um, that's our hope uh, for all of our Lemon Star constituents so they can share their experiences. Um, and so once there's a public hearing in February, um, you have up until July 31st of the following year to get all of the bills passed that you have filed in an ideal world. Yes. 
Um, so can you share some of the great legislation that you've been able to pass in these yeah. last two years? So there's lots of different vehicles to pass legislation, yes. right? Like a bill can move completely on its own as a standalone bill. And we've seen that happen. Um, in my very first term, we had a bill around uh, domestic violence survivors and protecting them from um, tax implications when their yes. ex-partner filed taxes fraudulently, it severed, severed mm -hmm. that relationship. And that was a small fix, um, but that bill moved in completely on its own. A lot of times we'll see bills go through uh, a budget or a larger economic development bill or a bond bill or um, a larger, what we will call an omnibus bill when yep. we take up a lot of mental health legislation mm -hmm. together or a lot of education policy together. Um, and so, so this session, the very first bill that we were able to, to kind of get over the finish line happened in the first budget. Yes. Uh, and it was- I remember <laughs> that very well. The sexual assault evidence um, kit reform, part of what was still lagging was the ending of the backlog. And yes. we've been working and teaming up with the minority leader, Brad Jones, mm -hmm. the head of the Republican party on this issue. Um, and we found out that despite three years of giving the state crime lab $8 million to end the backlog, they still hadn't done it. And the speaker was really committed to making a forceful statement yes. in the budget to say, we really mean it. You have to give us some good faith effort in ending this backlog of 6,300 kits and testing them once and for all. And we put in reporting mechanisms. Yes. So it really held the crime laboratory accountable to, to making progress. And that's something we're going to continue to watch yeah. its implementation throughout next session. Yeah, and I and honestly, I'm disappointed and frustrated that we really do think that we're going to be spending more time yes. um, monitoring this because while they've made some progress, yeah, they haven't made as much progress as some of the really great um, departments that are doing it on their own. So, yeah. so Bristol County, their district attorney went and got federal funding to do their efforts. Boston. And Boston Police Department is doing their own effort and they're solving cold cases. And right. we know that the state crime lab can do the same with and bring justice to these 6,300 survivors whose kits Absolutely. were never tested. Absolutely. Um, another piece of legislation you got passed shortly after the budget was what we nicknamed the Green Act. Mm -hmm. And that also requires some state funding, yeah. federal funding, ARPA money. So can you explain that bill um, and the process behind that one? Sure. Uh, so I went to some of the environmental advocates uh, early on and said, I'm an admirer of environmental policy. It is the number one issue here from young residents. When I go into schools, it is all environmental policy that they want yes, to talk about. That's true. Um, and, and I wanted to make sure that it was accessible to folks in Lemonster and Gateway Cities that we want to make greener choices, but our budgets often don't allow us to, to make those decisions yeah. to, to put solar panels on our roof or um, to invest in heat pumps to heat our homes. And so we looked at ways that we could bring together all of the resources and make the Mass Safe program work a whole lot better. So yep. we came up with this green um, act and we got six and a half million dollars for a pilot program. And this is really exciting yep. because we're going to challenge gateway cities like Lemonster and Fitchburg and other smaller communities that yep. fit the same demographics, kind of like Gardner, Gardner that's yeah. not quite large enough. We wanted to keep bringing them in and say, how can we retrofit single family homes and small apartment buildings and give incentives to homeowners and landlords um, to remove the utility costs from right. their home? Not only is it good for the environment, but it's good for folks' budgets and it'll keep them in their homes longer. Right. And so we know heading into the winter, everyone's really nervous about yeah. the, the price increases with National Grid oh, yeah. and we've got to help this. And if we're going to meet our climate change goals, housing is a, is a big polluter. Yeah. And so helping our older housing stock in Gateway Cities mm -hmm. just, just be retrofitted, um, it's going to make a big, big dent in that. And as you said, this was a pilot program yep. that we got passed. So we're looking to do more mm -hmm. in the upcoming session. And so, so this is a bill we're anticipating we're going to refile yes. kind of with some tweaks. Yep. But because this pilot program is still being developed right. by the administration and we're excited to team up with and the Healy administration. And we want to see how it's implemented mm -hmm. and all of that as well. So yeah, yeah. be on the lookout for that, folks. Um, so that was in 2021. Mm -hmm. 
Fast forwarding to 2022, because again, the legislative session is two years. Now we're at the end of it. We're in our December episode, um, currently filming this in November. Um, the governor actually has one of your bills on his desk right now, hoping to have that signed on Thursday. Can you explain more of your legislation that you have kind of gotten through in 2022? Yeah. So folks know that one of the reasons I, I ran for office was to make higher education, public higher education more affordable and more accessible, especially to residents yeah. in Lemonster. I'm a first, the first person in my family to go to college. It opened so many doors. I went to UMass Amherst, my brother went to Mass Bay Community College and got his technical degree after me. Uh, and it really launched opportunities for us that, that our parents hoped we would have more, more of a shot than they did. Um, and so one of those challenges is student debt. And mm -hmm. Massachusetts, because we have a highly educated workforce, also means that we have a disproportionate share of student debt amongst our residents. More than a million Massachusetts residents carry student loan debt. There was an old law that came about in the 90s that um, actually put it into our law that you could lose your license, your professional license um, would be the most common uh, if you defaulted on your student loans, if you fell behind on your student loans. Well, it's a really old policy and a really bad punishment um, that would take away people's ability to pay back their loans. If you lost not only um, your license and your ability to do work, how are you ever going to get back into right. good repayment? Um, so we teamed up with, we actually had a very broad coalition of legislators, uh, Dave Moradian, who's a Republican in the House, and I teamed up on the Student Loan Borrower Bill mm -hmm. of Rights. We teamed up again. Caitlin Bergarabedian was also working in yep. the House, um, and we worked with Senators Eldred, Senator Fatman, Senator yep. Lewis, um, a bipartisan group on the Very Senate side. Person, yes. uh, pretty much as far on yeah. the spectrum of political ideology as you could get. Quite a gang. <laughs> uh, and, and we worked together on this bill because it's just an old school of thought that, that came up in the 90s yeah. and most states have taken this law off their books sure. and banned this practice. And we, it's not being used right now, but we want to just make sure um, while we're dealing with so many challenges with the federal student loan servicing that that folks can continue to work, continue to, to get into repayment um, and pay off their student loans. Great. Um, so there are some other bills that have made it pretty, pretty close to getting past this legislative session. And so I will give you the opportunity to talk about things you're excited about towards the end of the episode, looking ahead mm -hmm. to next session. Um, but these policy conversations sometimes can seem um, very, very broad, very mm -hmm. um, statewide, mm -hmm. right? And so a really great opportunity to talk about um, great policy and funding a little closer to home is what you advocate for and what you file in the state budget every mm -hmm. year in April. Um, and so I'm not gonna go as far back as 2021 now because again, time, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so thinking of 2022 yeah. and this year's state budget in yeah. April, what were some of the um, funding you were able to secure for some of our local organizations that you're really, really proud of? For 2022, we were really focused on folks' immediate need, um, shoring up organizations like um, the Spanish American Center, Ginny's Helping Hand, Catholic Charities, Diaper Bank, mm -hmm. um, North Star Family Services that provides family shelter, growing places that provides food sustainability and availability, because we were still coming out of the pandemic yes. and those organizations really have seen an increased need. So, so helping right. our local food banks. The diaper pantry yeah. was something that uh, Rep. Mindy Dom from Amherst did a diaper drive because she's trying to create a statewide diaper bank. And we called up Catholic Charities that yep. runs our, our regional diaper bank. If anyone needs help with diapers, please call Catholic Charities. And we said, what sizes do you need? And they were like, four, five, and six. And so yes. we went and picked up and then dropped them off and found out they were completely out, out. of four, five, and six. I thought they were just running low. Not a single diaper. Um, and what do you do when you're the local agency that they serve right. not just Lemonster, but the whole North Central region? Yeah. It's more than 20 communities come to the North, to, to Catholic Charities in Lemonster yep. to access the diaper bank. Um, and so, so we talked to Maritza and said, hey, if we could get you some funding, how many diapers do you give out? And then we learned mm -hmm that they're able to, currently with their diaper bank capacity, give out 30 diapers a month to a family. We all know that babies need, and toddlers need, far more than 30 diapers in a month. That's probably the equivalency of one a day. Right, and so 
we knew that we needed to, yeah. to lift up this story. And it was a way for us to, to not only share that what's going on in Lemonster right. and North Central Mass, but to talk about for our families who are in need of diapers, you really need them. Of and we need to make sure that we have an infrastructure to help families access this. Um, and people might be surprised that, mm -hmm. that kind of SNAP and food benefits, there isn't a diaper allocation. And what do, no. fa what do, what do families with young kids do? Those are a really essential part of, of their kiddos' health. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And so speaking of Jenny's Helping Hand, Catholic Charities, we partner with them often um, in our office uh, when we do constituent services and all of that. Can you tell folks what exactly they should reach out to our office for? Yeah. We are happy to assist. Yeah. This is primarily what I do in the office. Mm -hmm. And so I just want folks to have an understanding of what our office is able to help them with. And we were more than happy to do so. Yeah, I, so so many reasons. If you have an issue with any state agency, that is a reason to call your state rep. Um, you can reach us at 978-227-5278. The contact information's at the end of the show. Um, and we talk about this in almost every show because folks Always. don't necessarily know to call their state rep for issues. Yeah. Um, and because of the pandemic, lots of folks who had issues with the unemployment system came to our office to get help, um, more than 500. Uh, thanks, Isabel, for all of that work uh, and managing kind of all of those needs. Uh, and, and folks would come back and say, hey, I'm having issues with rental assistance and RAFT. Can you help me with that? I'm having issues with my health insurance. Can yep. you help me with that? Um, I'm having issues with food assistance. Yep. Um, uh, and so, so basically we say, if you are on hold with a state agency, please give us a call. Like we need to know when these systems are breaking down and your time is precious and most of our residents don't have an hour to sit on hold waiting, we can get you a call back. Mm -hmm. So we encourage folks call early and often. We continue to have folks who we even helped with unemployment who oh, like absolutely. waited six, eight weeks because they didn't want to bother us. This is my plea bother us. It is our job. <laughs> uh, please let us know if you're having trouble. We're hearing from a lot of folks around fuel assistance. There was mm. a change where the, the fuel assistance provider changed yes. to, to making opportunity count, Mock and Fitchburg. From, from um, the New the England, New from England Farm Workers. Council. And so for folks who are having issues um, with fuel assistance, they're working through things. Yes. It seems to be going, honestly, a whole lot smoother than when it was with the New England farm workers. Right. Uh, so we're hoping uh, that the new system, the new resources, that we really pumped a lot of resources into fuel assistance, anticipating some of these utility bill challenges. Yeah. Um, and folks might be surprised at what the income limits are for fuel assistance. They're higher than a lot of the other assistance mm -hmm. programs. Um, and we encourage you to apply because once you qualify for fuel assistance, you get a discount on your electric bill. There's so many other things it unlocks. Especially uh, during this time of year. Yeah, we don't want folks worrying. We've talked to people who are rationing, um, who use oxygen and are rationing their oxygen use because they're worried about their electric bill. No one should have to do worry about that. Please reach out to us and we can connect you with more programs uh, to make sure that you're getting all the help that you need so that you're not worried about those bills this yes. winter. And even if it's a local issue mm -hmm. or a federal issue like social security, we are also happy to refer folks to yeah. their appropriate yeah. Um, uh, resource. Yeah, we always say if you're not sure kind of what level of government, we probably know who the right contact exactly. is. And so we're happy to make sure that we make that warm handoff and make sure that you connect with the right people. So overall, you would say your office handles constituent services, policy, mm -hmm budget, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like our office in a nutshell. Yeah. What are you most looking forward to next session, the start of next session in 2023? Yeah. And what are you hoping to get done by the end of 2024? I'm really excited. We get to talk about this. We haven't really talked about it on our TV show. We have a second staffer in yeah. our office. So Isabel is really <laughs> thrilled uh, that we get to split the work. Three brains are better than two. Yes. Uh, and we also rely on these really incredible interns. We've been lucky. I'm an alum of Northeastern University School of Law. So we get a lot of legal interns that are with us for, for three months at a time and a lot of other interns that are either high school or college. Um, if you're interested in learning how government works and you wanted and you're at a local college or university, Come to us. Come on we're, over. we're happy. We're happy to to let you know kind of how the state legislature legislature works. Peel back the curtain. 
it is, we represent the people's house, right? Like you should yeah. feel welcome and encouraged to participate in it. And so a lot of what I'm hoping to work on is our legislation. So we have our, our debt-free, accessible public higher ed bills. We have our sexual and domestic violence yes. bills that you're gonna be the lead on. We have a lot of really good bills in mental health, particularly around youth mental mm -hmm. wellness, our, our youth mental health bill, um, that I think we've done a lot of really good work over the last six yeah. years. And, and a lot of these have advanced through their first committee, which can be often the hardest hurdle, but then we have to keep that momentum going. Right. Um, and so, so really bringing these Lemonster stories. Your housing um, bill, perhaps. Yeah, our housing bill. We can that's talk, probably yeah. the one that's closest to home. Yeah, yeah, Isabel, this is Isabel's favorite bill too. Yes. So we, before the pandemic, Lemonster's the second largest city in Worcester County and we've never had a shelter. And that has been a challenge for the beginning of our work when housing be has become one of the largest constituent issues we're facing. If you are having trouble with rental assistance, if you're facing an eviction and need to be connected with community legal aid, please let us know. But one of those solutions that we yeah. worked on, we, we went to some of the experts that work in, in shelter and said, we don't, we don't have a shelter. We have no option for a Lemonster resident who's facing an eviction, like for where do they land? Yeah. And how do they get some time to stay in our community right. and find appropriate affordable housing? And so we went to the, thanks to the North Central uh, Community Foundation uh, and their amazing, amazing staff. They said, we wanna be a part of this and we're gonna find the money for yeah. a shelter. And we teamed up with them and. DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, to get some best practices of how do we open a shelter. And they, the department said, we're going through COVID. This is a challenge. We can, we can open a shelter. We'll, we'll actually give you the funding. You don't need to raise it locally. We need capacity in your region. We know there's yes. a need. And so the shelter has been running for two years yep. and it really inspired this new bill. We went to the same organization that made us, made some of those early connections to say, how do we make sure that when you experience homelessness in your home community, you get to stay in your home community? How mm -hmm. can we challenge the Department of Housing and Community Development to come up with a 351 city and town solution? Right. And how do we, the traditional shelter, which so many of our residents have uh, tried their best to stay out of, mm -hmm. are these mass shelters, right? They're yeah. called congregate shelters yes. where everyone is in large rooms together. Right. I think that's what a lot of people think of when they think of and shelter. And families think of it, yeah. that, that, that they assume that's what our family right. shelter system is. It's not what our no. family shelter system is. Um, we use best practices and it's a non-congregate care yes. model, um, but it makes sure that folks have their own space. It's trauma-informed. I come from this world of 10 years as a, as a rape crisis counselor, working with folks who have experienced deep trauma. The traditional shelter model doesn't work for a lot of folks and isn't really successful. And so, We've been working on this bill. It was reported out of the housing committee on its first try. And we thought we were just having a, we call some bills like conversation starters. Yes. We want to start bringing the people together to, to figure out how to have a conversation in this space. And the bill was reported out favorably. Um, it's a big challenge, it but one that challenge. a lot of folks who have never thought that they were going to be worried about how they could afford housing, yeah. we know are struggling right. with how to afford housing. And our affordable housing wait lists are too long, often mm -hmm. a decade. Yes. Um, and apartment prices are just really, really on the rise in Lemonster. And so we're hoping that we don't want anyone to ever need shelter, right? We want everyone to have affordable housing that fits their budget, that they don't have to worry about where they're going. But if they lose it, right, and they can't find an apartment right away, where do they go? Right. And so, we're really grateful for, for SMOC, which runs um, both shelter in our area yep. and something called Safe and Supportive Housing, which yes. is kind of the, our lowest income housing um, supports. Uh, and we've had a lot of residents who are thriving and this is exactly what they need and the support system and they can always afford it. They never have to worry about it. It's based on a third of their income. We honestly can't build that fast enough. And yeah. so one of the Absolutely. challenges is how do we have a, a safe and warm place for people to land to triage and figure out like, how do we get you into the right and appropriate housing that you can afford that fits your budget? Right, so as you said, that's my favorite pill that mm -hmm. we're going to be working on. And all of these pieces of legislation are 
uh, incredibly exciting for me to get to work on. Um, and so I'm excited that we are heading into this ready to go with these bills, with our new staffer. We have a little bit more capacity legislatively than we typically do, um, but I am really excited to continue to work with you these next two years, for the residents of Lemonster these next two years. You all heard it, Isabel staying I'm for staying. two more years. <laughs> Yeah, hold me you, to it, uh, um, but yes. Legislative aides, I mean, really honestly, like they are like our right hand, an extension of us, help us. My brain can only handle so much. Um, and I get to represent this great city uh, and our staff and our interns help us be able to do all of this really great work and, and juggle kind yeah. of the, the policy priorities, the budget and the other bills, the funding bills that come through to make sure we're getting as much money to Lemonster as possible. Um, working with the mayor, working with Senator Cronin, yeah. working with the city council um, and, and then constituent services, right? Like we have constituents who are facing challenges and urgently need help. Mm -hmm. And we've got what, two to three dozen people that we're oh, yeah. working with at any given time, helping navigate state government and it shouldn't take a call to the state representative, but we're happy to be here and we're happy to figure that out. And yes. when we can figure out how to make these systems work better so you don't have to call us, that's that's the best end result. Um, so so thank you for tuning into our December episode. <laughs> Isabel, thanks for uh, flipping the role Anytime. and uh, and filling in. Uh, we're really, really grateful for, for all the Lemonster residents who reach out and bring us ideas, bring us their concerns, help yep. us. Uh, work better in the state legislature. If you need to get a hold of us, you can always reach us at 978-227-5278. You can email me at natalie.higgins at mahouse.gov. Uh, and I hope you all have a safe and healthy holiday season, rest of 2022, and we'll see you in 2023. See you next year. Our January episode, we're gonna be back with Senator John Cronin and excited to talk about kind of Looking forward, what are we going to work on Together. in the next two years? Yeah. And we're really excited for a new legislative session. So thanks, everyone.